it's fine. And if we get too full, we'll go up on the above. So you want to make sure your palette's on your right. If you're right-handed, you want to make sure you got your brushes and a place to put used brushes. I did get a tip that I shared with some of my other students last week. Uh, and I picked this up at the Dollar Tree yesterday. It had a roller and a brush and stuff with it. Some painters will put walnut oil or some type of oil in a little tray like this. And instead of cleaning their brushes every day, they just leave them in the oil. And that, if you're concerned with using mineral spirits, because some people don't like the toxicity of mineral spirits or turpentine. So you could just wipe them off really good with a paper towel and then, um, oh, my tape doesn't always do good. And then um, just lay them in this oil and then just wipe them again as, you, as you're going. So that's something I'm gonna try. I haven't done that before. I'm always looking for new and improved ways to work. Um, Bob, do you mind pulling that trash can out for me and sliding it over here? You also wanna have a place to throw your paper towels. So if you're at a workshop, thank you. Usually at a workshop, I put a little Kroger bag Good morning, Harriet, on, uh, on the edge of my easel, just so I have a place to put my paper towels. And they'll tell you at a workshop to put your paper towels in the metal trash can if you've, got a, if you've used mineral spirits on them. And I have a little, mineral, a little metal trash can over here that says tarp rags, because those are combustible. So if you've been in your mineral spirits a lot, cleaning your brushes and it's saturated, put them in that metal can just in case. I don't know anybody that it's happened to, but it can happen. So the first thing I do, I have mixed up some colors but from my last uh, palette. I think I have enough of everything. I put a little bit of medium out. I'm gonna have a look at the painting to see if I need to redraw anything. Cause you're kind of, your eyes are fresh right now. You are just looking at it for the first time after a while. This is when you have the most objectivity is it's just right the first time you look at it. So I'm gonna ask myself, has my drawing gone off anywhere? Um, does it not look like her? I did want, to, I worked on it last week after y'all left and I got it all covered. I did go back and forth. You'll see in the video, I put purple here and then I went back and I put blue and I still don't know which color I'm gonna end with. Uh, I didn't like the purple so much. It was just really, really dark and dense. So I've gone back and forth. So we'll see when I get towards the end. I masked in the pearls with a, a, a medium dark gray because I wanna have three values for those pearls. And I wanna paint the pearls in a rhythmic way. I don't wanna sit there and paint every single pearl real detailed. I wanna have a, a, a dark, a mid-tone, a light, maybe a highlight, at least three values on those pearls. And I'm gonna just hit them like bam, 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 bam. Thinking about where the light's coming the whole time. So that's the other thing. If you need to draw yourself an arrow on your painting with a piece of charcoal or, or pastel, it's a wise thing to do because you, throughout the entire painting, you need to consider the light source. It affects everything that you're working on here. What happens if you forget about the light source is that you end up making everything all one value. So if I'm thinking, I told you guys last week, the lights coming from the window really kind of side for her because she was up on the table and it was coming in this way. So the lightest thing on her was this area here. Not so much, usually it's here when the light source is way up high but this is the lightest place on her. So nothing on this side needs to be this light. So if I'm just dancing around here, boop de doo not thinking about it, and I've got some of this really light yellow, and I go, oh, I need to put some light over here, I need to stop myself, because there's a whole nother range of values for this side of the face, because it's shadow. The same will be true down here and the per with the pearls, because the light's coming this way, so the, so the little highlight for each pearl. It, there's a highlight, a mid-tone, and then there's a, a, what's called a refracted light, or light that's bumping up off of her skin onto the bottom of those pearls. So on this side, there's a real glowy orange color where the light's going through those pearls, and it's just bright, bright orange. I put a little bit of that in here. So. Uh, I don't really think I'm too far off on my drawing. I think I've stayed pretty true because I had a good strong drawing underneath it and I measured everything out. She, her mouth is off. Mouth is always off. 
<laughs> yes, Harriet. Do you see something? I'm going to no. But when you're painting here, is this like you do in there? I have moved everything out here to start painting out here because well, it's so dark in there. Well, I wondered because I saw your gooseneck. Do you normally put your gooseneck on it when you're painting, or do you leave it off so you paint it brighter? Uh, I don't mean to get off. No, way. that's I'm a great how, question. How to put the light so you can best make it it's light a, and dark? It's a great question. It's important to consider your light because you'll paint it, especially if you're painting at night or under poor lighting circumstances. If it's a cool light bulb, you're going to, it, it's throwing cool, hey girl, uh, cool light all over everything. So you're constantly going to be reaching in here for warm color and you're going to make it too warm. If it's a really warm light, you're going to be constantly putting blue on it. And then when you get out in the regular daylight, an even keel light, it's going to be all off. So I have a light my husband bought that is a full spectrum light that's half, it's like 5,000 in the middle of cool and warm. So it's pretty close to what you would see if you just walked outside now. It's, it, as it gets closer to noon, it's gonna get hotter and hotter and warmer and warmer and almost wash out all the color. Uh, but I do like to work with that light. Sometimes I'll bounce it off the white ceiling because if I put it right on my, canvas it's too strong right, right. so sometimes it just depends on usually out here because these are balanced fluorescence and uh, fluorescence not my favorite but it's pretty balanced so when I get up the next morning it's it's pretty much the same so really like we are now with some natural light coming in it's just a medium to start it is a medium to start. as you're painting, you're painting. and I quit asking no I love it. Do, so you can change your color at the yes. beginning if I'm doing too dark or too light, you know what I mean? Yeah, so see that helped, except that I'm gonna be sitting in front of it a little bit. But you need to have good lighting. That's a great question. And sometimes, like I said, I'm getting all this stuff ready, sit down to paint, don't even think about the light. Right. You know, there's a lot of things to think about when you paint. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it was perfect, thank you. In fact, if you have a question, please stop me because sometimes that, that covers something that I've totally forgotten. So, so the light is better now that I've opened that blind. You don't want direct sun on your painting ever. It's to, it, just like you wouldn't want to put a harsh floodlight on here either, because you're going to wash everything out and you're going to, you're going to struggle with that too. So I don't really see anything. If I were going to redraw, we always did this in Shirley's class. I would get a small detail brush, just like a small round like this and a little bit of medium, and a little bit of a um, medium-dark mixture. Let me just show you about what I would use, and I'll wipe it off. And then I would come back in here and just redraw the painting if I was totally off with the portrait. Um, and that's, that's important to do because, again, if you don't determine that when you first sit down that and i'm happy to look at your painting before you get started today um, to see if there's anything that's off that redrawing is really really important i'm going to do what's called oiling in which simply means i'm going to put a little me medium on here because it's all dry and it's not quite as absorbent as it was last week because i have a layer of oil paint on there so it's kind of giving me a better surface. My paint's gonna slide around a little bit better for me today than it did last week. Last week was a booger. I'm gonna put um, just plain medium and I'm just gonna kinda gob it on there. I don't want it drippy on here. And you have to kinda get over to the side to see how much you've put on there. And then I'm just gonna take a paper towel and kinda rub it in just so that I have a little satin sheen over the whole thing. I don't want, again, I don't want this drippy wet with medium. You can kind of look at it again from the side to tell where the medium is and where it isn't. Some people are real concerned about their painting being sh uh, shiny and they don't like that. So if you're working on something and you're trying to keep it real pastel, um, then you might have to figure out something else to do and not oil in. The reason I like to oil in is it brings all my colors back up. It gives me a sort of a wet-ish surface that feels like um, wet paint again. Have your paper towels handy. 
and, and, and any color that has sunken in. As oil paint dries, it, all the oil absorbs into the canvas, and so it'll make dead areas that are called sunken in areas where the paint gets really um, chalky looking, and the color lightens usually. So when you oil it back in, it, it darkens everything just a little bit, which would be like it should be when you after you varnish. I'm also, I glazed a little bit of an orange glaze the other night, it had dried, and I came out here and I glazed a little bit of a burnt sienna type glaze over the whole thing. So she's a little too orange for me now. Um, but I wanna put a little tiny bit of color to work back into. Um, and if you spend a few minutes just observing your picture and kind of asking yourself what you like, whoops, that's not what you want. That's not what you want. No, <laughs> um, observing what you want. And look how easy that is. To, because everything's dry today, there's nothing we can do to ruin this, to ruin this, um, or ruin if you're from the South. Um, whatever you do today, you can wipe it off and get right back to this. So that's why oil painting has such a uh, forgiving nature to it. We love that. So I'm gonna, I am gonna put just a tiny bit of something on here, just to give it a little bit of color here. And you're gonna think, oh my goodness, what is she doing? Again, I wanna paint back into that. You don't have to put color on it. This is called glazing. I'm just gonna glaze a little bit of a skin tone on there. And now that it's kind of wet, a little bit wet with a tiny little smidge of color back on it. Some of my uh, shadows are really cold. Like this shadow around her nose is so blue that it feels like a bruise. So I put a little bit of a orange, pinkish orange over these blue areas just to warm them up a little bit. Because then I'm gonna put a little bit of my light ochre back in because I'm gonna pull these lights back up again. And it's so nice to paint into this glaze. Uh, if I were just trying to paint into a, a dry paint, it would just sit there on top. But because there's a little bit of oil and glaze on here, that's a little too yellow. So again, I think you could see from how I did last week, and if you got a chance to watch the video, you can see how I would put a, a note on there and I'd go, oops, that's wrong. So, you know, work that way. This is a, f I'm using a flat brush today just because I was glazing with that and I picked it up. But it's about a uh, half inch wide and I'm just putting a little tiny note of color. It's also a little bit lighter there and I'm kind of overshooting it a little bit because I'm gonna blend this down but I wanna bump the lights again. Here I'm gonna just drag a little bit over the top. To, see, that's too too much, too much. Um, so let me get a clean brush and just kinda lift that off. That's too light. What did I say earlier about the lights on this side? Do you remember? It's not as, not, it's, not as light. Not as light. Yeah. They're not as light, so I need to go to a darker value when I, when I get ready to add light on this side of the face. That's a little bit too orange. Uh, from across the room, she looks very different than she does from right here. So I, I can probably leave, I'm, I am gonna leave some of this pink in her cheeks, a uh, peachy color in her cheeks. I don't wanna take that out, but I wanna, I wanna tone it a little bit and give it a little bit better transition. Remember to get up from your painting often, and I'm just dragging a little bit of this peachy color over the top of this, of what I've already got on there. Now, is it really orange from where you guys are sitting? It's pretty orange. Everybody's just dead silent. They don't wanna critique me. Looks orange back here, Chris. Looks orange, thanks, Harriet. <laughs> so I can put um, a little bit more, because it's, again, it's all wet, I can just barely, I'm just barely dragging over the top of what's already there. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of glowing her up a little bit. I'm, I'm using this more peachy color that I mixed uh, and I'm going to a little bit lighter. But I wanna keep these skin tones really pretty. I don't wanna get chalky with them and that's what happens sometimes as you're working. It just starts to get chalky. So there's really not a lot that I wanna do to the skin today. I, I just wanna, I wanna soften some things together this transition between this and this is pretty sharp. 
So this is really light yellow, this is really medium orange. So I wanna go in between the two and put something that's, it's pretty dark right there. It's a little bit more glowy here. So I can just barely, I mean, if you could feel my brush, if I wasn't having to let you guys see and I was in front of it, I would probably be holding the brush like this so that I'm holding it really light. But I'm just barely dragging some over the top, what's called scumbling. Scumble it has a whole different um, feel than direct painting because you're not scooping it up and laying it on. You're just kind of dragging it over the top. See, that was too orange, but it's, it's pretty orange right there. So I can come back in here and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this skin. I wanna show you about eyes and I wanna do a couple of the pearls and I know you guys are anxious to paint. So um, if it starts to get blotchy, I'm gonna watch watch any blotchiness. And today, because I have that, um, that glaze or oiling in over the top of it, I can take one of those little soft brushes, the little mop brushes like I told you guys I get from Big Lots and this is a middle tone, I don't know why it's not. And I can just barely, like if I have any areas that are blotchy on her, I can barely drag that over the top, those little mop brushes. Still need a bit of a transition there. If things go too quickly from light to dark, usually there's, you need a transition tone in the middle to help that soften a little bit more. And you then get up and look at it from across the room. Her nose is still real um, cool and I need to warm it up. So I'll probably work on that a little bit more. So when I get ready to work on the eyes, I always questioned when I was doing it myself, do I do the eyelids first? The lashes, the eyelids, the, there's a little bacon strip right here that sometimes you can see, it's not a bacon strip, but it's about the thickness of a strip of bacon. That's your lower lid right before the lashes come out. So do we work on that first? If you have an iPad, if you have a way to zoom in and look at this um, close up, I would encourage you to do that when you start working on the eyes. When I first lay them in, I want it to be blocked in and I wanna look at it from a distance because I just wanna put the basic shapes and values in. When I start to work on the details of the eyes, then I want to zoom in a little bit and look at how her eyes go. If I were, if I had a model here, I would um, walk up to the model a little closer and look at her uh, a little closer. If you have a Mac, you learn to hate that spinning ball. All right, so I wanna bump, take the contrast down just a little bit on this. I wanna see, her eyes are kind of a greenish brown. I'm gonna do the lids around her eyes first, cause I don't have those really exactly like I want them. I am gonna put my glasses on, cause now is when you get up a little closer to it, um, and I'm gonna go back in here and soften this a little bit, but I wanna do all this at the same time. There's no rhyme or reason to it. You can do it whenever you want to, whenever you're in the mood to, but I, I, I have them kind of chunky around her eyes and I just wanna smooth that out. The whole time I'm working on the eyelid, I'm remembering that it's a sphere. So if you guys have done the basic shapes in here, you can remember that a sphere has uh, a light, a cast shadow usually, and we won't have that on here necessarily, but you'll have um, light, medium, and dark. And you need to watch for that. There's the, Across that lid is not all one color. There's a lot going on across the lid. I know it's hard to see from across the room, so I'm just gonna do one eye. Let me stay over here and just do one eye. Typically, whatever I do to one eye, I usually run over and do to the other eye so that I keep them uh, in sync because sometimes you can get over here and start working on one eye and you work on it for an hour and then you move and work on the other eye and then get back from them and you got two wonky eyes that don't even go together. Has anybody ever done that? I know y'all haven't. No. Never done that. Never. <laughs> Never happened. It's a little bit lighter um, as I move. She's got light bouncing on, on this eye right here on the edge. And if I get that in now before I put the iris in, um, sometimes that's helpful. Uh, remember I said that the eye whites were cool. 
So they're kind of a bluish tone. I don't have that mixed up yet. Just a little bit of ultramarine blue in with white. And if it's too bright blue, then I'll put a speck, sometimes a flesh in there. But usually I have a little bit of flesh on my brush. So I have to remember to keep my head out of the way of the camera. So I'm gonna go back in there and just put a little bit more of that blue. When I'm painting the eyes, I'm thinking about, um, I'm going over the lines. I'm not trying to stay in the lines. And I want you to be careful about that because if you try to paint in the lines too much, it'll show on your painting. It'll be kind of like a color by number. Um, and don't worry about making things a little bit too big because you can come back and carve them down like a halo around everything if you do that. And she has this real cool light on her, on her lids right here. And right here because remember these are two balls so the lights coming this way and this is almost a light blue right here on her lids well I've put it in there but it's just it's still not registering light enough but I have to remind myself it's a blue color and I'm gonna overshoot it right now just so that you can see it from across the room um, okay so for brown eyes I'm gonna get a little bit smaller brush for this this is where having a nice, one of these nice little rosemary's come in handy. So it's a good idea to kind of keep everything out in handy. So this is what I'm using now. It's a rosemary Kalinsky sable, size two. And it has a real nice little detail. It's a beautiful brush, actually. And I'm gonna use a little bit of raw umber. But your, your uh, earth colors sometimes dry really, really fast. So you have to make sure you have, have those out. Now I'm gonna put a little bit of raw umber for her brown eyes to start with. And then I asked myself, how much of the eye white can I see? How much of the eye white can I see? What's the shape of the eye white around it? Because I'm looking at negative space as I do this too. Not just the positive space. Yeah, on this side. Yeah, it's a triangular shape, and I'm really kind of trying to be mindful of that as I paint this. Um, I also have, she's like I said, she's got that pretty hazel color of eyes. There's a little fleck of hazel in there. It's not bright green. Um, and so I like to show this, <coughs> explaining that the eye is like a marble. I've shown you, you guys this a million times, but the light... The light's coming from this way in this illustration. It hits the marble, it goes inside, and this is refracted light. It's, the light's kind of captured inside that sphere of the, of the cornea or the iris. I guess it's the cornea. But I do know that there's a, what I call a star and a moon in the eye. And if you leave this out, a lot of times the eyes are dead looking. And a lot of times in your photograph, you don't see that moon. But people come into my booth and they go, oh, your eyes are so pretty. It's because I over-exaggerate this right here because the eye, again, is translucent. There's The light goes inside, and then it's kind of captured and rocks around on that bottom side. Um, again, you see the eye white in here is a kind of a fleshy gray color. The, the biggest mistake people make is they make the eye whites too white, and they're not white like that. Now, Lauren's are pretty light right now because of the way the light's hitting her, and some people have really light eye white, so you just have to kind of look at that and see. Uh, but she, hers are really bluish, and so I'm going back over here and getting some of this greenish, greenish color. Yes, and I'm gonna pop that, that's not light enough. I'm gonna pop that little bit of a greenish, I may overdo it. This would be the star, the, the moon. It has to be really light because it's not showing up. And it's, the moon's gonna be on this side because the light's hitting on that side. And what I did to this one, I did to this one. I'm gonna go back and get the darker brown. And here's the, here's the time when you need a mall stick. So I don't wanna lay in my paint. So a mall stick works really good. It could just be a wooden dowel or a curtain rod but it gives you a nice steady hand and it keeps you out of your paint. I lied, didn't I? I'm gonna have to do both eyes at the same time. That's just how you have to do it. 
There's always a um, cast shadow, unless the light's coming from underneath, which is really rare. There's always a cast shadow on the top of the eye, iris, right here. And I'm really looking at the shape of that. It's a little higher than I have it. There's always a cast shadow because the lid juts out like a window awning. Um, and typically, the eye iris color is a little darker. It has a dark rim around the edge. <clears throat> now, it, when it's time to paint your pupil, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna soften this in just a little bit. And I need, I do need ivory black to paint. Sometimes I'll mix up my black, but it's never, to me, it's never as black. Our pupils are black. Um, and, so and, you, and it's better from the, for the most part if you let the pupil um, kind of melt in with that upper cast shadow. I'm just gonna soften this in a little bit. A mall stick is a little awkward to use at first, but it's a, a lifesaver. I'm looking at the shape of the bottom of her iris. And then I also ask myself, are, are the edges of the iris, are they really sharp or are they sort of soft and milky? And sometimes you can really see that, sometimes you can't. At the end of this, I'm gonna show you a little trick that I usually do. I go back in here and um, lay a little piece of paper towel on here. because they're way too sharp right now. They're just like, zzz. that's the only way I know to describe it. They're just too, too sharp. I put a little tiny bit of medium with my black just cause I want it to be fluid. And then I'm gonna come in here and pop these pupils in. Her eyes are not quite this dark, I don't think. You wanna do the pupils at the same time so that you put them in the same place. Pupils are always round, unless you're a snake or something or some cats like um, Siamese cats or certain cats sometimes will have a kind of a slit for their pupil. And also uh, pupils are not misshapen. They're just round. So you have to watch that. You don't want them to get misshapen. And she has a lot of lashes. So I'm gonna try to come in there and put a little bit of a lash line. I'm using a lighter brown. So I'm gonna have to do these eyes a couple of times. I'm not gonna be able to get them done in one swoop, probably. Would be nice if I could. My hands are a little shaky this morning. And then her lashes, here's another miss, um, thing we do uh, most often, is we put a dark line under the eye right here. She has no eyeliner on. She has um, lashes, which are pretty, pretty dark but they don't start right here on the edge, they start down here. So a lot of times I'll get kind of a watery, um, milky brown, if they're brown, if she's brown and she is, and I'll just put dots under here and I'm starting down under the, um, where the bacon strip is. And it's not dark enough, so I'm gonna move slowly up and get a little bit more paint on there. I don't want to put an eyeliner line on this child because she'll look really funny. Now, see, that's a little too dark. Yeah. Starting to get a little too dark. But I can go back with a clean brush, keep a paper towel in your hand, and then just dot it. And I want to draw spider eyelashes on here. Don't hold your mouth funny either when you're painting. I think we all do that. I was noticing that on the video that I was like, oh, Christy, crop your mouth out of there. That looks funny. All right, so I'm gonna go back in here and just kind of dot her lashes in because they're too dark. And I'm gonna make her top a little bit darker because she that's her main thing. But I, I need to make sure that this lid is done before I do that. So, 
I'm going to put a little bit more flesh, just a little bit on my brush and kind of work this in. I'm looking at the shape of her lid and it goes a little higher up here. There, that's a little better. There's a little bit of um, a pretty peachy tone. I'm seeing a lot of different tones around here, right here. That's a little bit lighter. And I know you, you, you wanna say, how do you see all those different things? And you, the more you do it, the more you'll see different changes of, of uh, warm and cool. Well, that's a little bit better. Now I just lost the lid line. So I'm gonna come back in here because the lid line is darkest right here. Her eyes sunken in right there the most. So I wanna come back in here and darken it just a bit. Right over her iris seems to be the darkest place. And then it's a little warmer and it kind of closes in down here a bit. This is kind of funky here. Let me fix that. And then this kind of melts right here and goes into her face. Now there's a real light tone right here in the corner where the tear duct is. And that almost always catches light. So that's a real light yellow right here. And I can overshoot that a little bit. Make it a little bit brighter than it seems. And there's a little bit of, of um, light right there too. Just a tiny bit. Put that in and then soften it down. There we go. And then my most favorite part, I'm gonna soften this and I'm gonna go back in here and put some lashes. But I like to put the lashes and I like to put the, the uh, highlight on the eye. It just makes all the difference. It makes them come to life. And I have a little tiny bit of blue on the brush with my white, and I'm kind of gobbing it up. The light's coming from this side. And a lot of times I'm gonna just rehearse the stroke a couple times before I actually hit. So it's good to do these at the same time. So they're in the same place. And that sort of makes them pop a little bit more. They're still not, uh, they're still not a color I like. I also ask myself on the eye white, is there anywhere that's a little bit lighter? And there is right here. So I'm gonna put a little bit, and if there is there, there will be here too. Just a little, not as bright. Sometimes you can put a little bit of, of a whiter color there and it will make the eye look wet. So, <clears throat> so let me do a little bit of lashes and then I'm gonna show you a little, I'm gonna have to go back and work on the lid line around this one, but I'm gonna do a few lashes on her only because most people don't, you won't see their lashes, you might see little dots, but with her, she has really big, crazy long eyelashes. So I couldn't do a portrait of her without putting those. It's better, if you make them um, not like spider webs, but you have to watch and see where do they start to turn and change direction, and they do right there. So that I mean, that's what her eyelashes look like. They're that they're that long and that bright. So if I painted her and didn't put those in, now it's there. It's a little bit too standy outy. So I need to come back in. I've got to clean. I've cleaned this same brush off. And I'm just gonna softly mute the edge of that um, the edge of the iris there. And if it's, and I know you can't see from way back there, but you can come up here and look at it. But what I like to do after I do the eyes is because I make them too crisp and sharp and and they're standing out more than almost anything else on the painting, is I like to tear a little piece of paper towel and just lay it on there. I'm not rubbing it, and I'm not moving that paper towel at all. I'm just taking a little, you see it lifted a little bit off, and it settled the eye down a little bit so that it's not so sharp and crisp, because it's a watery thing. So I don't, how does it look from back there? Can you tell? So that, 
she, everything about her is her eyes. So if I spend more time on her eyes and I have other things that aren't so bad, people aren't going to notice. I mean, that aren't so good, people aren't going to notice so much. But it's really important that I get her eyes right. Now, I'll stand back at a distance from this and see, because I've sat there the whole time. Yeah, that's pretty close. Uh, it's a little too dark under here, and it might be warmer under there. Um, this, this has a little bit of a warm tone. I'm just real careful when I start putting any red around the eyes because they look like they have pink eye. Um, but there often are warm tones around the eyes, so you do have to kind of watch that. So I'll go back in there and correct that. I'll come back and do the other eye. Um, her irises, I believe, are a little bigger than I have them here. So I think I'm gonna need to bump this one over just a sliver, maybe. I'll measure those. I'll get down there and, and check it because she has big irises. Sometimes people make the irises too big and that's a common thing. Let me just show you quickly how I might do these pearls. I really don't know. I'm gonna have to try to work this out. Uh, at first I ask myself, I have the dark value in and it's blue. And I ask myself, are they warmish or are they coolish? Do you, does anybody have any thoughts? Do you see warm or cool in those pearls? Do you see either? You see some warm. I see cool here. It's a combination of, of yellowish flesh because that's what's around those white orbs is all her flesh. So there's gonna be flesh in there and there's gonna be cool blue tones in there as well in the shadows, which I kinda already have. So I'm gonna come over here with a mid-tone flesh and I'm gonna just bump it. Two, three, four, let's see how many. I have to stay on track here. I already kinda had them drawn. All right, that's really fleshy. I don't know if that's gonna work. Then I'm gonna get a little bit of cool and come back in here with the blue. And I know the bluish cool tone <coughs> is on the right side because that's the shadow side. I'm not too concerned with them being exactly the right shape yet. I'll fix that. But you, you're, you're better off with a braid or pearls or anything, a, a, a pattern in fabric that's repetitive. You're better off to just do it, doing it rhythmically like this and not trying to do each individual pearl. starting to look like pearls over there a little. Mm -hmm. Then they each have a highlight on them and it, I don't ever use pure white. So I ask myself, is it a warm or a cool highlight? And it has to be cool because of the north white coming in the window. So I'm gonna come back in, maybe with my smaller brush that I was using for her eye. I'm gonna clean it, make sure there's nothing on it. And I'm gonna get a little bit of this blue, cool blue, lightest light come back in here and pop a highlight on each one and see if I can get away with that. Might have to be a gob of a highlight just so that it shows. If you, if you want to learn about painting jewelry, Sargent is your man. You can study how he handled jewelry. And a lot of times, it, if you look at these uh, lockets and things around these women's necks, it was a um, gob of paint is all it is. I'm putting them in the wrong spot, but you kind of get, get my drift. But I'm, and so what would happen is I, after I do that and it's kind of gobby, I might come in here with one of these little soft brushes like the Big Lots set and just come back in and kind of round them back up. They're going to get probably the place that they're the most... Um, prominent is right around in here. And then I'm gonna make them softer and more diffused as they go out. So I'd have to spend a little bit of time on this. Then I might go back in and put uh, dark, a little bit of blue and raw umber um, in a couple of spots down here just to kind of accent them a little, maybe, I don't know. Or maybe I'll use the um, skin 
because it looks like her skin tone, which is real orange, bright, almost bright orange. Um, I might come back in here with that. Even that bright, maybe, because there's a couple places where it's that bright. And I'll shape the pearls with that skin tone, that reflected skin tone in there. Because you're not, you're not always thinking of outlining something and then coloring it in like a coloring book. You want to think about, you can make the object bigger, and then you can come in with what's around it and carve it back down, thinking mass against mass. So I'd have to get back from that. I think I think that it's gonna work. I need to tweak it some more and just pop a little light more on this upper side. Uh, but I think the pearls are gonna work. When I get down here, I'm just gonna let them fade. And I, what I did on the dress is instead of using uh, just pure white, which my brain wants to do because it's a white gauze dress, um, I put blue and I let some of the purple tone show through. And then I'm just going to drag and scumble this over the top. And I want—I don't want it to be real striped. I want it, I want to have. If I squint and look, I've got like some big masses. I probably need a bigger brush. But I want to let the canvas help me with that texture. Uh, this works really good on linen and any kind of fabric that you're working on that you can drag your brush and get some let the bumps of the canvas look like the f weave of the fabric so i can do it it's lightest right here <coughs> and i've kind of lost a little bit of that underneath so re remember what i said at the beginning if you lose any part of this and you don't like what you've done today you can wipe any of it off so I got that a little bit too much. So I just put a little bit of turp on my brush and I'm, I'm using this nice flat one because it's good to kind of come back in there and lift it off. I could also go back in there and put these little stripes back in if I wanted to because that's the elastic around there after I've put that on. So I have to decide if that's too, if that's too light or not. I want this whole part of her is gonna be the lightest, this side because of the way the light's coming. It's gonna be lightest here, and as you move down the body, it's not gonna be quite as light. So, is that helpful? I did the same thing on this little tool up here on her hair. I just uh, got some white with a little bit of blue in it, and I just drug it over this, and that's probably too blue. I don't wanna tie the whole bow or anything. I wanna just, I might make it brighter in a couple of places. It's really bright right here. So I could just barely drag a little bit of that right there. And see, each little thing you do bumps it a little more and a little bit more. But what happens is you put a little bit of that light on there and you go, oh, and so you put it everywhere mm -hmm. and it ruins the effect. So just a little bit right there is all I need because that's where the light would be hitting and it's bluish. So if you start grabbing pure white, you're gonna chalk up your painting. Try as much as possible i'm not saying it's a rule because sometimes you have a lot of paint on the canvas and everything's soaking wet and you need pure white to get that color to lighten what you're doing is you're mixing on the canvas you know your color's really thick and wet so you need to put, put pure white in it but for the most part you hardly you just don't see pure white even looking out my patio doors right there on the white brick if i squint that's going to be either warm or cool i have to figure that out and because the pool is out there, up, up under my eaves, we've got a big, huge blue pool out there. So I know that it's gonna be blue in the white, most likely. So you have to be a little bit of a detective and look at what's around your object to figure out whether it's gonna be cool or warm because a lot of times your naked eye can't determine, you know, whether it's, and sometimes it looks warmer because it's next to something cool. But if you isolated that, it would just, you know, be a cool color, but if you put it next to something that's that's really warm, it's gonna look cool going. So I kinda like the direction. I feel like it's her right there. So I'm gonna clean up some of this shadowy color around her nose. I want her nose to be rosy and warm. So I'm gonna clean that up. I kinda like the hair. And I, I did this, the forehead and the hair while it was wet. 
and I took a mongoose brush and I wiggled those together because very rarely do you see a hard edge unless it's Heather has bangs, but not like who is it that does the Betty, but it's not Betty Boot, but it's the, but typically it, all around the face where the hair is, is soft. It's just mushy. You need to work the edge of the hair and the flesh at the same time so that you can blur those. Or there may be like for me, there may be a, a strand that comes over, but this is a little bit lighter right here usually, right on the edge. So you really have to study the edges of hair and make sure you don't have any hard edges or it will look like a wig. What's a mongoose brush? Mongoose is the flat, um, it's a, these long flats that are easy to work wet and wet with. I'll pass it around and let you see it. This is probably not the softest one. Um, I've looked to try to find them at the at Hobby Lobby or Plaza. Um, they're they just soften. You can also use these little Hobby Lobby brushes. I mean, uh, Big Lots brushes that are like a little watercolor brush, just to kind of go in there and soften those edges together while they're wet. Now, I didn't go back in here and do that with what I laid in today. Any questions about oiling in or? Um, a baby's supposed to be really soft, so I need to go back and make sure. I want to redo her lips, too. Uh, her mouth is really dark. I don't know how dark I'm going to go. It'll depend on how sharp I get with these eyes. Because you don't want one feature to be jumping out a whole lot more than the rest of the features. Um, so, so that's kind of, that's my demo.